right. I'd like to officially get started today. Today we are talking uh, with Dr. Jeffrey Hamuda about microtia and the jaw. Dr. Hamuda is a jaw expert and we are so excited to have him today. Um, Dr. Moon was hoping to join us and hopefully she'll still join us. Oops, somebody else is joining us. Um, during the presentation, but she is currently in surgery. She did want to mention that she really values your relationship, Dr. Hamuda. I think you guys have been working together 15 or so years. And one thing she wanted to note is that she does appreciate how you treat the jaw and every patient individually, just like she does with the ears and that it's just not a cut and dry, you know, operation. So, um, you know, she's very, very thankful you're here and we are lucky to have you today educate us all including myself with some information I didn't know about my own child. So I can't wait till you get to uh, the wisdom teeth today so I can learn myself. Um, but if you could just maybe start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and go ahead and do your presentation. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, well, thank you for having me. You're right. I've known Cheryl for uh, probably more than 15 years, probably like 16 years now. So her and I go back a long time when she was originally at Children's Hospital. And that's where I'm at now at Children's Los Angeles. A little bit about myself. You know, I initially trained, I went to dental school first. And then after dental school, I went to medical school. And then subsequent to that, I did oral and maxillofacial surgery, which is a specialty of dentistry, um, which does a lot of jaw um, operations. And then, but after oral surgery, then I went and did another specialty, which was plastic and reconstructive surgery, which is a specialty of medicine. Um, and then after that, I did craniofacial surgery. And so Dr. Lewin and I met while we're in the plastics division at Children's Los Angeles. And it's, you know, a great relationship that we've had because, you know, her subspecialty is in microtia and ear reconstruction and mine is in jaw surgery. And as you probably already know, the two, the two go hand in hand. And as I was telling Tiffany, um, th there's really only two, you know, there's two important things that you should walk away with here is number one, and we'll get to this on some slides, is that most children, young adults that have had microtia or a small ear that needs reconstruction usually have a small jaw. The extent of how small it is is to be determined depending on growth and development. But the important factors are if you have a small ear and you have a small jaw, somewhere along the line, your you high likelihood are going to be in braces. And if you're going to be in braces, high likelihood that you would need your wisdom teeth extracted. And there's a possibility of subset of those patients that may need corrective jaw surgery. So those two entities are really the, the real questions to ask if, if your child has microtia. Uh, is the jaw small? And if it is, at some point when they have braces, do they need their wisdom teeth taken out? And if so, how do we get it done safely? And then number two is, if their bite is off, do we need corrective jaw surgery? And how is that timing of corrective jaw surgery? Um, so we'll, a lot of slides, but I'll go th through them pretty quickly. Oh, hold on. This is, a, uh, this is a patient who didn't have microtia, but I did an otoplasty uh, for her at, at some point, and then also did her jaw surgery. And patients that don't have microtia, they're looking at moving. Can you see my, um, Tiffany, you can see my actual pointer here? Correct. Yeah. So this is a patient on the left that was deficient in the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And then she also had a nasal asymmetry. So I moved her upper jaw forward, lower jaw back, and then came back and then did her nose. And you can see jaw operations, you know, have a pretty drastic effect in terms of changing the overall profile. Um, she was here on the left, very um, inward, socially introverted. And then on the right, you know, it's the best thing that's ever happened to her. She goes, she finds her personality um, and is really overall very, very happy. That's, a, this is about a four year, you know, between here and here, it's a four year follow up. So there's a female and here's a male, very similar, moved the upper jaw forward, lower jaw back, and then came back and did his nose. Um, and he did not want to have any otoplasty done. So we didn't do anything. But Ears and jaws tend to go hand in hand. Now, how about with microtia? You know, these two patients specifically, pre-op on the left, post-op on the right, didn't have microtia. They had other ear anomalies. How about with microtia? These two patients, their jaws were moved forward. In other words, in the, what we say in the horizontal plane, forward this way and this one backward. In patients with microtia, it's mostly not a forward movement. It's mostly a correction of what we call a cant and I'll show you what a cant is. But before we get there, 
really, really important. I was just explaining to Tiffany this earlier. Um, and, you know, she's had her son that's had um, microtia repair. The two things to really ask for is, are they getting their restorative dental work? Great. They're seeing a dentist. And at some point, do they need teeth extracted? Has your dentist or the orthodontist said, you know what, you need to get the wisdom teeth extracted? Have they been evaluated by an oral surgeon to have the wisdom teeth extracted? And if so, and they need to have them extracted, it's really, really important. I was telling this to Tiffany, is that usually we don't do those patients in the office. In other words, come to the office, get an IV and get some teeth pulled with, you know, get your wisdom teeth pulled with sedation and you're asleep. The reason why is a lot of patients with microtia because of the small jaw can have difficulties with breathing, um, can have problems with um, the trachea, the esophagus. And the last thing you want to, uh, in a situation you want to be in is to have a dental emergency in an oral surgery office without an anesthesiologist, as opposed to being in a hospital in a controlled setting. Both procedures are outpatient. You're going to have some wisdom teeth extracted. But in the hospital, we have an anesthesiologist. It's a controlled setting. You go home the same day in the office. Um, it, it, it's a different world. So we have an oral surgery office, and we go there routinely and extract teeth. But most certainly, we don't really do kids that have small jaws or severe microtia. Those will just bring them to the hospital and do it there from a safety standpoint. So it's really, really important when, when your kids are undergoing orthodontics um, or microtia repair to, to have a broad-based picture. Ear is small, jaw is small. We're going to get the microtia repair, then take care of the jaw. And that is typically the, the, the usual um, pattern is you get the microtia taken care of around five, six, seven years of age, and then we'll take care of any braces, orthodontics, or any jaw surgery. Um, we could skip that. So the factors to consider with a lot, there's a lot of kids, what I was telling Tiffany earlier, and I'll tell you guys is um, not every child that has microtia needs jaw surgery. There's certain factors to, to consider. Um, how severe is the bite? What, what age did the microtia repair happen? Um, what is going on with the orthodontics? I would tell you that as a rule of thumb, probably around 80 to 90% of patients that are undergoing orthodontia that have had, that have had microtia, that have wisdom teeth, need to have them repaired. However, a formal jaw surgery is going to be a, a much smaller percentage. It's going to be closer to 25%. So only one in four patients who have microtia, who've had the microtia repaired, really will need formal orthognathic surgical correction. The remaining 60-70% can be done orthodontically or with some other minimally invasive procedure as opposed to formal jaw surgery. So in Unlike the first two patients where, if you remember, we talked about the discrepancies anterior posterior, in, in kids with microtia, most of the um, severity is in what we call the cant. And what you see here is, in, this is a normal setup of upper jaw, lower jaw, and normally the cant or the arc of the upper jaw to lower jaw sits like that. However, in children with microtia, they could have asymmetries and the arc shifts. And the upper jaw comes down and the lower jaw comes down and you start having what we call a cant. So that's a big word, but it's really a simple concept um, in terms of understanding. It's basically there's crookedness of the upper and lower jaw. Some of the things we consider before jaw surgery is what type. Uh, most, uh, all of Dr. Lewin's are med poor. It makes no difference to us in terms of whether it's med poor autologous, as long as the uh, artery is preserved and it's been at least two to three years after the med poor reconstruction. So now that the ear is fixed, what about the jaw surgery? So we wait. If the wisdom teeth have been extracted and, the, and your child's had braces, we wait and verify that the growth is completed. And if growth is completed, then we'll assess and talk to the orthodontist. And if they say it's too severe to correct orthodontically, then we'll do a surgical intervention. Sometimes you move the jaw and you correct it, and it's still, the profile is still soft. In other words, the profile hasn't been completely corrected. If that's the case, then you do the lower jaw and you do a genioplasty. You move the chin forward and you can move the chin forward at six, seven, eight millimeters. And all you're doing by moving the chin, which is connected to the lower jaw, is really cor correcting the profile. The jaw operation is to correct the bite. The, the name of the jaw operation is called the BSSO. Um, and that is just a big word for splitting the lower jaw and moving it forward. The BSSO corrects the bite. And if needed, the genioplasty 
camouflages the asymmetry. In other words, if there's any crookedness, if you need to get a little more anterior posterior um, advancement. So let's go to surgeries. So the things to consider. The minimally invasive operation that we talked about is, is the, what's called the SARP, surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion. But before all of this happens, you're, you're seeing an orthodontist. So that's why the critical part um, is having communication between the orthodontist and the oral surgeon. And if your child needs a surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion, you can adjust and bypass um, this formal orthognathic surgery, I'd say 75% of the time. So a certain percent of patients, and you need to ask the orthodontist, will, will my child require a SARPI? Will my child require wisdom teeth extracted? High probability on the wisdom teeth. And then will they require formal orthognathic surgery? A Lafort is the upper jaw, and the BSSO is the lower jaw. Bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. So what we do is we, we look at the patient's face and we break them up into thirds. What you're looking at here is on your, on your left, the face being broken up into here actually in fifths, and then this is upper third, middle third, and lower third. And we start looking for symmetries and asymmetries. And then we look at the bite. Um, the, what you're seeing up here is what we'd like to see, a perfect bite. We look at the, what we say the occlusion. In other words, where is the molars on the upper jaw to the lower jaw? These are the canines, the eye teeth. This is what we want to see most of the time. This is what we see, a malocclusion, an open bite, um, that where the tongue sticks out. We can skip that. And we can skip that. I'm going to go to a patient because that's, I think, where you get the most um, information. Um, this is a patient um, that had microtia. You can see on the left side, she's probably a grade three microtia. And when you look at her straight on, her biggest complaint really wasn't that my bite is off. Her biggest complaint is my lips look crooked and my bite looks crooked. And if you look at her critically, this is what we call the commissure or the corners of the mouth. This one is much lower than that one. And if you can cheat and look and zoom in, you can see that her, these are her central incisors. You can see her bite goes like this, right? So if you were to draw a line right across where her teeth meet, they happen to go right from the corner of the lip on her left to the corner of the lip on her right. This is what I was talking about, a cant, where that crookedness in the upper and lower jaw. So, most patients will complain, yes, I want my bite corrected, but what they're really talking about is my lips look a little bit different, and one is higher than the other. And if you look very closely, if you draw a line straight down the nose to the upper lip and you keep going down here, what you'll notice is that her chin point is off to her left, right? Her chin point is over here. It should be here. So you have a crooked upper jaw, a crooked lower jaw, and a chin that's over here. So the only way to address that is by rotating and correcting the upper jaw and leveling it out, leveling out the lower jaw and leveling out the chin. And here she is on full smile. Now you can really appreciate the, the crookedness. So you see where, where this occlusal plane or the canting goes like that. And you see the gummy smile on the right side. And it's by no coincidence that everything tends to go towards the, you can see here, there's the microtia side. Now this is a patient who elected not to have her ear repaired and she didn't want it repaired and wanted to just move on in life. And then she came back to us when she was 16, 17, and at that point wanted to get back in treatment. So in this case here, we went forward and did the jaw surgery first. I would tell you this is the exception. Most families, most patients are getting the ear repaired around five or six. So what we do is have you open up, put a tongue blade, and that really tells you how crooked the bite is. Again, upper jaw is crooked, slanted down this way, lower jaw slanted, and the chin point, which should be right here where my arrow is, is all the way over here. And here she is from the lateral profile. You can really see her grade three microtia. This is her dental radiograph, her x-ray. And the important thing to look at here is we're simple people in, in, in oral surgery. We look and we number teeth, one through 32. We start on the upper right. This is actually her right side and left side. Her upper right side, you can see the wisdom teeth have been removed. The wisdom teeth would be sitting right where my arrow is. So that would have been tooth number one, 
and tooth two, three, four, all the way to 15, and tooth 16 would have been here, it's been removed. Tooth 17 would have been here, it's been removed. 18, 19, all the way to 31, and then tooth 32 has been removed. So the point of this is that the wisdom teeth need to be removed before any formal jaw surgery. You can see she's got her braces on, and these are what we call surgical hooks. You see these little hooks right here? These are the hooks that your orthodontist will place, and when, that's when we know you're ready for surgery. The orthodontist puts these hooks on so we can actually correct the bite. And here she is after her bite correction and showing that the upper jaw and the lower jaw come together very well. And you see, if we look at this x-ray, the teeth are meeting. And let's take a look at this. This is, so this is her preoperative radiograph showing the canting that I was showing you, how everything is up like this. And what we planned for her was a Lafort 1, a BSSO, so the Lafort 1 is the upper jaw, the BSSO is the lower jaw, and the genoplasty is the chin. So let's look at her here, and this is her pre-op over here. This is her immediate post-op. She's still really swollen, but you can clearly see that this bite blade is now nice and leveled, and here she is after the operation with hardware that's been placed. So the Lafort, which is the upper jaw surgery, is held together with plates and screws. And this is pretty typical, two plates on the inner aspect, two plates on the outer aspect. All of that is done from inside the mouth. And then usually three screws on the right, three screws on the left. And you can see the shadowing from here to here. You see that right there? This is where the jaw was advanced or moved or rotated. And then this is her post-operative radiograph showing that her bite is right in and that her hardware is in place. And this is another radiograph showing those screws in the lower jaw, the BSSO, nicely placed parallel, securing the bone from here to here and correcting her bite. And then we look our own analysis. Hopefully you can see these red lines and we look for symmetry. Remember the preoperative one that I showed you, everything was crooked. Here, everything is leveled. And then here's her biting on that bite, bite, bite blade again. And you can see, unlike the first two patients, she didn't, we didn't really move her anterior posteriorly. What we moved is her upper jaw up, the lower jaw up this way, and then her chin point. If I were to draw a line from here and go straight down through the nose, through her philtrum or that cupid's bow right there, and keep on going all the way down, her chin point is centered. And so that's her pre-op on the right, post up on the left. And again, I'm not showing her in the lateral profile because it's important to remember that most patients with hemifacial or microtia, it's mostly this crookedness and the asymmetry. And to summarize, it was corrected by cutting the upper jaw, rotating it up here, impacting it here, rotating the lower jaw to come to the upper jaw and then taking her chin and rotating it. And the access is all really from inside the mouth it, with, with the exception of a small little tiny incision, you can see it where my arrow is, that's to put those screws in. And it really, really, you know, what I've learned over time is it makes a huge, huge difference in patients. And I'm gonna read to you something that one of the families sent me yesterday and they gave me permission to read it. This is a patient texted me yesterday around seven o'clock, it says, Good evening, Dr. Hamuda. You may not remember me as you helped so many people. You did jaw surgery, chin alignment, uh, and straightened my son, John Morgan McKinnon. I noticed you're doing a live chat with Dr. Lewin tomorrow and thought we'd send you pictures of inspiration. Feel free to use them if it's helpful. We love you and Dr. Lewin and think of you every day. Johnny is now a firefighter. And so this is him. I'm just going to show it on my, there he is now. And so he's a patient of Dr. Lewin and I, and um, they literally sent this to me yesterday. Otherwise, I would have put it in the PowerPoint. But you can see he's ripped and cut and doing amazingly well as a firefighter. So I think I'm going to take credit for that because of his jaw, not his ear. So with that, um, I will open it up, and I'd be happy to – I know it's a lot of information, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions for you guys. Um, the, the real takeaway is twofold. Number one is let's – you know, depending on the age of your 
your child is to make sure you have a, I'm gonna to go to a, the Panorax X-ray, which is somewhere along here, there's a Panorax. There it is. This is the Panorax X-ray. And, and the reason why that's important is like I said, most kids with small ears have small jaws. And if they have small jaws and the wisdom teeth need to be taken out, really, really important to do what's best for your child. Most of the, most kids that need their wisdom teeth extracted who have microtia and a small jaw should be done in a hospital, um, outpatient surgery center, um, come in, get them taken out, as opposed to being done in a dental office. And that's really for safety for the airway. And then the next question is if they need jaw surgery, uh, making sure that growth is completed and then moving forward with someone who does this on a regular basis. That is always key. That's the message we always send, you know, to our families with, you know, these, you know, microtia and jaw reconstruction is they are very specific surgeries. And if you choose to go forward with this very specific surgery, make sure you're going with somebody who does it day in and day and out. Day. Tons yeah, of pictures, tons of people you can talk to because, oh, it just, it doesn't work if you don't. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the best way to do that, I think, Tiffany, is it's important for people to understand is um, you just ask, and, but you've got to ask the right questions. And, and the right question, for example, if I was bringing my, my son or daughter who needed my crochet repair with MedCore, I'd say, well, in the last 12 months, how many MedPort ear reconstructions have you done? And if the answer is I've done five, I'm like, well, that's great, but you know, I'm going to look around. <laughs> um, if the answer is oh, I do it on a weekly basis and I've did, I did three last week, I've done seven this month, that's usually you're in good hands there because it's really with experience. And the same thing with um, the wisdom teeth and with the, with the jaw surgery. You got to ask the specific question. And, and the question to ask is, in kids with microtia and a small jaw, how many of those patients have you extracted the wisdom teeth on? Or how many of those patients have you done jaw surgery on? Right. If that number is anywhere in the low end, you know, like, yeah, I do 10 a year, then I usually would say, mm, you, you're probably better off going with someone with a little more experience. If they tell you, yeah, I do that all the time, every, you know, every month I'm doing at least seven, 10 of those jaw cases, then you're in good hands. Great. Well, we have a question in our chat right here. It says, hi, my daughter has golden hair and she will be having her ear re reconstruction done with Dr. Lewin. You mentioned the ear has to be settled for two to three years first, question mark. Uh, she's 13 and she's watching you through Zoom with me. Um, and also, what about a tongue-tied child? Okay. So, you know, at 13, you've got plenty of time before formal jaw surgery. Obviously, the longer from having the ear reconstructed to the formal jaw surgery is preferred in, with MedCor because the last thing we want to do is have a vascular problem or an exposure of the MedCor. So if, if your child has a MedCor reconstruction at 13, realistically, the jaw surgery is really not happening until you're 15, 16, probably more like 17 years of age. So you've got plenty of time. Um, the, there is always the risk of when you're doing certain jaw surgeries of injuring the ear. So it, as a rule of thumb, we like to have the ear done, life has moved on, there's been no exposure, um, doing great, and we can move forward with the jaw surgery. You know, the, the, obviously the last thing we'd want to do is have the ear get exposed, you know, the med cord be exposed after a jaw operation. So as a rule of thumb, we like to have it a couple years. Every once in a while, there's someone who's got an amazing result and they're 17 and they just had their ear reconstructed when they were 16 and it looks amazing. And we say, okay, let's just move forward. Um, so that's number one. Number two is the tongue tie is easy enough to do when you're when you're having the microtia repair. Um, the tongue tie doesn't really affect the jaw surgery. Um, if, if you really are, you know, the, the, the appropriate term for tongue tie, the medical term is ankyloglossia. Ankyloglossia is tethering of the tongue. Anklo is a tethering tongue. Um, if that is interfering with speech, with hygiene, then it's reasonable to release it. And you can do it at the same time as the ear reconstruction. Um, Dr. Lewin is, and can do that with her eyes closed probably. Great. Um, I have a question from Erin. What does recovery look like for BSSO? Great question. So in the non-cleft, non-syndromic patient, recovery 
can be outpatient or one day in the hospital with some guiding elastics. Um, and But I usually tell young adults that, and most of this operation is being done at 17, 18 years of age, plan on doing it during the sum, your summer vacation or your Christmas break. Because even though you're only gonna spend one or two days in the hospital, you're gonna have elastics, you're gonna be swollen, you're gonna feel uncomfortable, you're gonna be on a soft pureed diet. High probability that you'll be able to open and close, you probably won't be wired shut, but at the end of the day, it's still gonna be, you're gonna have rubber bands and you're gonna be swollen. So I usually tell patients as a rule of thumb, plan on having some downtime for four to six weeks. In the hospital, if you have golden hearts or you have you know, hemifacial microsomia, the, the recovery is a little bit harder and usually you're spending two to three days, sometimes four days in the hospital. If you have nothing else other than a microtia, uh, usually for a BSSO one night, sometimes you can go, I've had some that want to go home the same day. Okay, great. Um, another question, what age should the first consultation be? Depends. If it's for jaw surgery, it usually is at the time of orthodontics, um, and that's so you could re so you could establish the communication with the orthodontist. In other words, setting up a treatment plan. Now you know your child is say 13 years of age in with orthodontists and orthodontist. We like to see them, whether it's virtual um, or look at an X-ray, telephone consult. So that way we can help guide the orthodontist and say, look at. I don't think this can be fixed without jaw surgery or look at, I think it can be fixed without jaw surgery or, Hey, we should take the wisdom teeth out at age 15. Please let us know when you're ready for us to move forward. So as a rule of thumb, when you start orthodontic care, you should be getting a consult with an oral surgeon to, to ask two questions. Number one, do my wisdom teeth need to be removed? Number two, will I need jaw surgery? Okay. And I guess just my follow-up question on that. So just to confirm, it should be the orthodontist who's kind of providing that x-ray or is it like your dentist or? It's, it's usually at the oral surgery office. A lot of, a lot of general dentists will, or orthodontists will have a, that general x-ray called a Panorex. In our office, we actually do a 3D CT. So the Panorex is an older version, um, which um, is, is a reasonable x-ray to get a screening film. In, our, in most oral surgery offices, they're getting a dental cone beam CT. So not only can you see the wisdom teeth, you can see the jaw, you can see the nerve, you really get an assessment of everything. Um, most orthodontists um, have at least a Panorex. Some of them have a cone beam CT, either or. And so it's usually um, with the oral surgeon, but if your orthodontist has the capability and they get it, you just bring it on a CD and you don't have to repeat it. Okay. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Oh, do you wanna stop sharing your screen for a second? Sure. <laughs> there it is. Perfect. Um, and then you already showed like an, another question, um, is the scarring you would show just, I mean, you can't even tell, it's just like a little pin, that's it. is that all? That's it, that's it. The rest is inside the mouth. That, 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 there's a little tiny stab incision, that's what I showed there. Um, it's maybe three mil two, three millimeters. It's usually one or two stitches and you can't see it. Okay. And that's to get the screws in. Um, so you use a special instrument where you go through the outside to put the screws in. The rest of the operation is from inside the mouth. Okay. Um, somebody had commented, my daughter is having bath so next week. How do we protect her med for ears? She's having a BSSO next week? Yeah, I think it. I think that's yeah. wrong, but I think that's what I think. They yeah, mean. I think that's what it. That's what it probably says. Um, well, you know, hopefully you, the surgeon. I mean, you just got to tell the surgeon, please make sure they pad the ears. Um, you know, th this goes back to you know experience. So I would ask, who I don't know who you said is asking the question. Um, is it a surgery here in the Los Angeles area? Who is that surgeon? Um, do they have a good relationship with it? Um, and, you know, basically asking them, be careful when you put the head dressing on. So when, when the BSSO is done, there's a special head dressing that goes on that puts pressure on the ear. Um, so what I would tell that surgeon, um, if someone asked me, uh, what's the best way to protect it, is be careful, make sure the head dressing is not too tight and have some type of cushion. We use an egg crate cushion and we just put it right on the ear. Just like, remember when you had the med pour uh, initially done, you had that ear cup on there? 
This is very similar. It's not the formal cup, but it's just the actual cushion that's underneath there. It's hard to put a real cup on there um, when you're in the operating room, but there's a little cushion you could put on the ear. Great. Um, this is a question from Kathy. Do you or Dr. Boone ever do anything like fat transfer for soft tissue deficiency in the cheek before or after jaw? Well, I mean, look, the, yeah, the answer is yes, but I think you have to use it very conservatively. Um, if it's soft, if you're replacing soft tissue because someone had a soft tissue deficit with like hemifacial, then it makes sense. But if you're, if you're camouflaging a suboptimal jaw surgery or a suboptimal lower jaw or chin by putting soft tissue in there, I think you got to be careful because as you get older, what people don't tell you about fat transfer is if you get older and you gain weight and we fast forward and now you went from 18 and now you're 33, 34, and there's some weight gain in there. Guess where else the fat gains weight? On the face. So you got, I'm very judicious on where we inject fat and how much we inject. Can you do it? Yes. There's a lot of things you can. Is it the best procedure? I think you got to, you know, really look at the soft tissue envelope and look at the x-rays and make a decision. So yeah, we, we do do it, but I've been doing less of it because um, I've had some patients that have put on 20, 30 pounds and they come back and this, this side has gotten much bigger than the other side because interestingly enough, you take that fat from the belly and it maintains the memory of those fat cells. So when the belly gets fatter, the fat cells in the belly are getting fatter. Guess where else the fat cells are getting fatter? In the face. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, right? <laughs> um, I have another question. If a patient does um, travel to Los Angeles for surgery, how long are they expected? How long would they be in Los Angeles for surgery with you? Yeah, so we get a lot of patients that come um, from, you know, outside of Los Angeles. And so what I tell families is, get a hold of us. We'll help you. We'll walk you through everything. We'll walk you through, you know, finding a hotel that's close to the hospital. We'll walk you through the entire process. But in general, we're talking, if it's double jaw surgery as a rule of thumb, plan on two to three days in the hospital, and then about seven to 10 days um, for a post-op check. Probably something very similar to when you're getting, you know, flying in for the ears, because you want to get that first post-op check. If it's single jaw surgery, it's only going to be one, usually one to two days in the hospital, and then again, seven to 10 days. So we'd like to have you there for at least, you know, seven to 10 days. So that way we can get the operation done and get that first post-op check visit. That first post-op check is to make sure you're doing okay with diet, the rubber bands, and everything is doing well. After that, you can fly, go home, um, and then the rest of the visits can be with the orthodontist until you're ready to come back, usually a couple months afterwards, just to make sure everything is okay. Okay, great. Um, Aaron comments, this has been very helpful. I'm so glad we're in LA so we can see, come see Dr. Hamuda. Um, I look Kathy forward to seeing you, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Kathy asks, is this often covered by insurance? The genioplasty, the chin, is usually not, but the upper jaw and lower jaw is usually yes. Why? Because the upper jaw and lower jaw are for function. Um, and you need that for bite. Of course, you know, every insurance is different. Every insurance has some exclusion criteria, but the answer is yes. Um, I would say most of our patients were able to get it covered by their insurance. The chin, the genioplasty, we don't even ask anymore because you risk the chance of them coming back and saying, well, you asked for a genioplasty, a chin, we're going to reject everything. We're not, we're not approving anything. This is really only for purely cosmetic. You're not happy because the, the smile is crooked. You're eating and drinking okay. Um, we're not covering. So we've stopped asking for the genioplasty, the chin, because really that, that portion is for aesthetic to give you a better profile. But the upper jaw and lower jaw, I would say most PPO insurances, in my experience, are covering it. And what percentage are they covering at? Is it 80%? Is it 85%? It just depends on what insurance policy you have. Sure. Um, Somebody asked a question, is it ever an option to do um, ear reconstruction after the jaw so that you don't hurt the ears? You could, but in general, you know, kids can get teased a lot. And I would tell you the best route is to do the, you know, to do the ear reconstruction as early as possible and then come back and do the jaw. If the surgeon is skilled and is to take care of kids with microtia, the probability of having a problem in the operating room with the ear is really low. Um, and so the psychosocial effects of waiting until you're 18, 19 of not having an ear are, are real. 
the healing process for an ear reconstruction, and you know, I'll let Dr. Lewin give you the details on that, but in my experience, and what I've seen is that kids heal better with the ear reconstruction done earlier than you know, at five or six or seven than at 18, 19. Right, right. That's because they also think about their trip to Disney. That's right. <laughs> Um, well, I should also mention too that, you know, our families are now coming in to do like the 3D scans and heading back home and they're coming in for pre-op before they have um, ear reconstruction. So, you know, that would be a great time to come have an in-office consultation with you while they're already in LA with yeah. Dr. Lou. I know the two of you guys have shared endless patients together and, and work really well together. So I would encourage people if they are traveling for ear reconstruction surgery and have questions on the jaw to contact your office and you know if if it seems you know necessary and appropriate to come have a appointment while they're in Los Angeles. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And we, we see a fair amount of patients and and look at and um, you know at the at worst case scenario, you get a good consult to just give you an honest opinion. Um, and you say, you know what, Rob, that's great. We're going to get our ear done and we're going to get our jaw done at home. And I think that's reasonable if, if you have a good surgeon that is experienced in microtia as well as jaw surgery. Um, and, but I can tell you that a fair amount of patients come and they say, all right, well, you know what, we're going to come back and have the jaw surgery. And at the same time, we're going to go get a follow-up check. You know, we'll get a follow-up checkup with Dr. Lewin, then come and have the jaw surgery. I think that's perfectly fine as well. Okay, great. Well, our time is almost up here. I just wanted time to flies. thank you so much for your time today. It was super thank informative. You. And I'm glad that, um, you know, we always kind of encourage our speakers to, you know, talk to families in a way that we can understand it. Because sometimes, you know, it's really difficult. And I thought your presentation was, it was very easy to understand. Um, you still have some big words out there, but I, I at least could follow yeah. So, yeah. And I appreciate the take home points that I didn't know about for my child. So I go. guess I have to get those x-rays over to you. Send, send um, them over. And then, you know, if, if anyone has any, you know, specific questions, my email is, should be on the card. Um, it's jhamuda at chla.usc.edu. You can just send me an email. Um, I'm more than happy to just communicate back and forth and give you any, uh, answer any questions or any advice. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you your so time much. Today. Great really talking to you guys. Everybody, we will have this um, uploaded to our website tomorrow. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye.